Hi folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today we're going to really take a deep look at specifically what is meant by cardiovascular disease, how to monitor it, and how to think in terms of cardiovascular risk. Remember that over 50% of people in this country are going to die of a cardiovascular disease. Stroke, a heart attack, a blood clot. So let's look at this. When I think of cardiovascular disease, acquired cardiovascular disease, I think in terms of four different elements. And we'll discuss each element, how to monitor it, and what the normals are. The first one is blood pressure. Hypertension is a common cause of both cardiovascular, kidney damage, stroke. High blood pressure is an evil, evil disorder, whether it's a chronically elevated or a spiking elevation in blood pressure. And hypertension is typically caused, there are multiple causes, but it's caused by a contraction of the arteries of the blood vessels that push that back pressure back to the heart. So the heart has to pump harder in order to push through these narrow vessels. And so hypertension is a very, very important concept to monitor. And if you go into your doctor's office once every three to six months, that's inadequate. You're going to have white coat syndrome. The numbers are going to be off. What I rely on for my own patients is to monitor your blood pressure three to five times a week. Try to do it at the same time each day. In my family, every weekday morning, we check our blood pressure first thing in the morning. And then if ever I've got any chest pain, if I'm short of breath and I don't know why, I may check my blood pressure as well. But we have a cuff next to our bed and I do two things. So when I'm lying flat, I try to have my, or sitting up, I try to have my um, arm about level with my um, heart in this, in this manner. I use an upper arm cuff. You can use a wrist cuff. It doesn't much matter, but I prefer the accuracy of a cuff above my arm. <coughs> and I hit the button once and I ignore the first set of numbers because that's calibration. I then hit it a second time and it's always the second set of numbers I take. I don't do any deep breathing or anything like that to, cal to calm myself down because I want to know what the worst numbers are. At the same time, while I'm checking my blood pressure, I put an oxygen saturation monitor on my finger. On the other hand, on the opposite hand. And that'll check my saturation, but it also checks my heart rate and my heart rhythm. And on the heart rhythm side, I want to make sure that I'm chronometer regular, that there's no skip in the beats, that the rhythm is very regular. If there are any irregularities, if there are any skip beats, I want to make note of those. If my rhythm is above 100, I want to know about that. In fact, for me, if it's above 80 at rest, I'm worried about that. I have no problem with my heart rate being in the 40s and 50s. Technically a bradycardia, but it doesn't bother me. I normally run in the 50s anyway. So not a concern for me. I just want to make sure that the rate, the rhythm is regular. When it comes to blood pressure, the normal blood pressure out there is 120 over 80. But a normal blood pressure in our space is actually around 110 over 70. I typically run 110 over 60-ish. But it doesn't much matter. You want to keep a record of your blood pressure. So you write down each number or you record it somehow. Because a change of your own personal normal is more of a concern than exactly what that number is. Now, I would always like blood pressure at rest to be below 135 over 85. That's kind of the number as a practitioner I have. And either of those two numbers, the systolic or the diastolic, if either of those are above 135 over 85, I have concerns. And certainly, if you're ever above 140 over 90, I don't care why, I'm really worried about that. And if that's a frequent occurrence, that needs to be medicated. And then we've got to address cause. Why is that up? Treat it and then ask questions. Why is it up and what can we do to bring it down so you don't need medication? And certainly, if your blood pressure is elevated to that point, I may consider taking a baby aspirin tw twice or three times a week. Because the risk of blood clots, the risk of of plaque damage, the risk of damage is much higher, but control that blood pressure. So the first parameter is blood pressure. We've got to know why, but we also got to treat the high numbers. Don't ignore them. Don't ignore them at your own peril. The second cardiovascular disease that we look at is um, plaque disease. And this is the one that cardiologists most commonly stay away from testing. They just want you on a statin. You've got to be on a statin. You've got to be on a BS you don't. What you do want to know is what your, and this is the test, and it should be a baseline test, coronary artery calcium score. And a CAC score, a coronary artery calcium score, can be done quite easily with a non-contrast CT scan. Your doctor can order it or we can order it for you. 
Sometimes insurance will pay for it. They should be paying for it. But it's about 100 or 150 bucks out of pocket if you want one. And you want to know what your CAC score is because it's predictive of your risk of a heart attack or a stroke. It, it is specific to plaque disease. If you have a score below 100 and you are asymptomatic, we can track that. Ideally, your score should be below 10 or 15. If it's above 100, if your CAC score is above 100, I would recommend getting a stress test, preferably an exercise stress test or a chemical stress test, because you want to know under stress of your heart, is that plaque narrowing your blood vessel so much that you've got early changes on an EKG, even though you're not symptomatic, even though you don't have chest pain, is your EKG taking the strain? In other words, is the heart not getting enough oxygen or nutrition when you're exercising because of the limitation of plaque? If your stress test is negative, I would repeat the CAC score on a regular basis. But more importantly, if your CAC score is elevated, Meet with a metabolic specialist and see what you can do to reduce your nicotine consumption, to reduce your carbohydrate consumption, to stabilize your plaque uh, progression. Very, very important. Certainly, if your CAC score is above 400, you want to take that immediately uh, uh, seriously and you want to get in to see a cardiologist and get a full workup. Whether that's a stress test, whether it's a CT angiogram, even whether it's a coronary um, uh, uh, um uh, uh, an injection of dye into your coronary vessels, you want to know more about your heart because you don't want to be sitting in the, in the um, sorry, coronary angiogram is what I'm thinking of. You don't want to be sitting in the ER clutching your chest having had a heart attack because you ignored the CAC score. CAC score is a crucial, crucial, crucial screening test and should be part of blood work, should be part of any other screen, in my opinion, not done by GPs, not done by it's cardiologist way enough, and we can certainly do that. That looks at plaque disease. The next set of disease that you want to be very aware of is your clotting risk. So it's always useful to have a rheumatoid factor and an ANA done as a screening test to see if you've got autoimmune disease. But anytime you travel, anytime you're sick, you get COVID, you have a cold, anytime you have had a physiologically stressful time, you break an arm, you break a limb, you're in car wreck, whatever that may be, your risk of clotting in your veins, this is different than clotting in your arteries, your risk of clotting in your veins, deep venous thrombosis, goes up significantly, including pregnancy. And that is where you want to monitor the situation, and that may be an indication to take a baby aspirin while you're at risk. I certainly do that. If I've got a cold, if I'm traveling, if I've had some significant risk that increases my inflammatory risk, inflammation, that predisposes me to, to intravascular clotting, I'm going to treat that. I'm going to take a baby aspirin. So monitor that. <clears throat> and the final one, as we've alluded to before, is monitoring your cardiac neurology. And that is an EKG. EKGs are very, very useful to look at the rhythm. Now, you can go to your family doctor, you can go to your cardiologist to get an EKG. But the best way to do this is to create, to have your own little tool. Uh, there's Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, which is a good device. There's the Sono Health 96, a little device that I personally use. It's basically where you touch with your fingers or with your hand or between two points on your body, the electrical flow to and from your heart, and it gives you an EKG. Now, it's a screening test. It's not perfect. The reason that the Cardia is good, but that's where you have to sit at a table and put your fingers on the thing. Um... Uh, Whereas for me, the, the Sono Health 96 is something I can carry with me. I can go for a run. I can go to the gym and work out and do my own little stress test. And it tells me what my heart's doing. It gives me an EKG that I can then record and show to other doctors. But monitoring your cardio, cardiac neurology, your rhythm is so important. And you want to be in sinus rhythm. You want to be in low heart rate sinus rhythm. But any abnormalities need to be checked out. And if you see changes to your EKG, bring those to the attention of doctors like myself, your family doctor, or a cardiologist. Because arrhythmia disease causes as much morbidity from a cardiovascular disease as plaque does. So those are the four things you want to look at with cardiovascular disease. You want to check your blood pressure. You want to check your screen for plaque. You want to screen for arrhythmias with an EKG. You want to screen for and be aware of your risk of blood clots. And then you can do something about it. 
That's cardiovascular protection, folks. Stroke and heart attack risk. Take care of yourself. But the single best preventive therapy, three things. Don't use nicotine. Don't use carbohydrates. And be as physically active as you can be. Though that triumvirate is the healthiest way to live. And then you've got to know your pre-existing risk and your current risk and manage that as well. I am the carb addiction doc. If this has helped you, if this has prevented a heart attack, I may never know. We don't know if you didn't have one. Interesting, huh? But if you like this conversation, throw us a bucket, our PayPal account, which is in the show notes, or leave comments. But even if you're on a carnivore diet and you think you're very healthy, know your cardiovascular risk and take care of it. 